problem with this particular topic is that I think it's about time we started thinking somewhat differently about our approach to so-called foreign affairs. These are not foreign affairs if you live in that place. We're, we're taking such a U.S.-centric vision when we look at these things and, and the, and the uh, particular reading, if you've got the um, reading, the particular reading I think is really loaded um, in this particular case because the person who's writing the article for this town is from Rand Corporation. And if you know anything about Rand Corporation, you know this was a spin-off of the big WW2 and a particular Air Force leader decided that we needed to stay abreast of the technology because the Ruskies were coming. And so we built in, and they did it at uh, McDonald Air Force, I mean, uh, for, uh, Air Company, and that's where they headquarters were for a long period of time. And Rand Corporation has morphed into something which is almost in charge of our international policies. It has become the, the sort of think tank for the US government on how to think about things that are outside of the United States. And that frightens me. Um, I'm also a little nervous about the advertising. If you look at who advertises in our briefing book, you'll see that there, there might be some connections. Our good president, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, told us to be aware of the military industrial complex. Well, this is it, uh, I would say, in spades. So this particular guy, Dr. August, uh, Austin Long is the author of uh, the, this particular article. He's been with Rand Corporation for many years. He graduated from two engineering schools. So his mental thought process is numbers and counts. Like we did remember very, during our Vietnam War, you all, you all watched Ken Burns again. And we had the body count. And the body count was what we thought about. Many of the people who worked on that particular war, in the thinking about it, were people from the Rand Corporation. And um, I, I, I think we gotta look out a little bit. So what I would like to do this evening is to shift gears. Now, if you've been to Afghanistan lately, you know that um, our current president in Washington, whose name uh, is never mentioned in my household, the um, We've sent another 5,000 troops to bolster up that operation. And if you know anything about Afghanistan, if you read the briefing book, you realize that Afghanistan isn't a country. It never has been a country. And it probably never will be a country. It's an artificial creation of the British government to map out a, a piece of time. We used to call it the Northwest Tribal Area. And the Northwest Tribal Area is still the Northwest uh, West Tribal Area. Um, you, you could, in the, if you were in the Foreign Service for the British Empire, you were promoted. Um, part of what your promotion was by the languages you knew. And if you got posted out to the Northwestern Frontier, it was a really good deal, because there were 270 languages. And, you know, if you picked up one, two, three, four, you could be promoted. Um, if you look at who's there, you realize there's a lot of Uzbeks, a lot of Tijuks, there's a lot of um, Pushtu, there's, I mean, if you want to learn what language we speak, some of us speak Persian, some of us speak uh, Urdu or a language related to it. Some of us speak languages which, which we don't know. And you know, there are some blue-eyed people in Afghanistan that claim to be the descendants of Alexander the Great. This is a crossroads, but it isn't uh, a, a nation that has a reality. If you go to Kabul today, you'll find a huge construction. Looks like a fortress. Looks like a. It looks like a place that we're defending, and that's the American embassy. And American embassy people do not leave Kabul. Period. 
But it just said another bomb is. Yes. So that um, they can't leave, obviously, it's very dangerous for them to leave. But if we're going to win the uh, hearts and minds of people, you know, the goal, which we told was somewhat nation building, um, you got to leave Kabul because Kabul is not Pushtu. <coughs> it's not a big chunk of the country. So I would like to use as a source for tonight's <coughs> ramble, I'm going to have ask you to take a look at uh, a book by Gopal. He's a he's a Indian ancestry, and he uh, he. Uh, I'll give you the name of the book. No good men among the living. America, the Taliban, and the war through Afghan eyes. Two zero one one four, two thousand fourteen. So it's relatively up to date. You don't have to write all the uh, title down. Uh, it's good. No good men among the living would, would be all you need to do to look it up. So first I challenge the question of whether there is a word called foreign that ought to be part of international relations. This is a global world. We're living together. We're all, and you know, I hate to use my own background. My name is O'Toole, so I'm you know, going to go when they come to get the Catholics. I'll be the one that goes. We, 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 we call ourselves the Catholic Church because we think we're all the way around the world, and to a certain extent we are. But the human species is quite obviously, and if we're going to really talk about global peace, we have to start talking about global realities. And we see things in terms of we and them, we're never going to do that. So I'm going to push for a different kind of thinking, the way I'm going to push for it. As we look at Afghanistan, let's look at it through the eyes of Afghanis as largely as we possibly can. Now, it's very hard to interview people in a village in one of the three <coughs> southwestern provinces because for all practical purposes, if you step very far outside of one of the camps, and by the way, in camps, it's not a bad life. You have ice cold Coca-Cola, and you have, um, you're going to have turkey for Thanksgiving, and they're going to stuff it with the same kind of stuffing that you get at the supermarket here because it'll be brought in from helicopters <laughs> that descend and we'll have pictures on the news that'll show us, look, the boys on the front are eating turkey. But if you step four feet out of that compound, the chances of you coming back alive are very small. Now, we have 11,000 troops there now. Most of them are on the line of fire in the sense that if they step out of these, these bases, they're in trouble. So what I'm going to do with Gopal is um, take a look at his book a little bit. Gopal um, decides, and he's got background, he's, he's written for the New York Times, Harper's Magazine. He's a, he's a person of South Asian ancestry. And by the way, our expert tonight is an expert not on Southern, uh, South Asia. I mean, remember Afghanistan and Pakistan are part of South Asia, not Southwest Asia. They are not Arab, and they are not Arab speaking. So that we gotta look out that we don't get in, you know, all of those ragheads over there, as I've heard some of our State Department people say. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at the book through his eyes because he's been out there. He's been outside the military. He's not been locked into Kabul. He's walked with some of the people and he's talked with some of the people. And he's about the best, of, you know, I looked around and tried to find a way to get into this and I thought Gopal is our best source. So you, know, you gotta follow me on that. It might not be so. So Gopal picks three people to take a look at. He looks at a housewife in Kabul, and he follows her life. And he looks at a warlord, I guess that's the best name, and he follows his life. And I think this is really good because you're getting into their lives and you're watching how they're living. Now, he, uh, he also takes a military commander at a higher level to follow. So, but these are all Afghanis. He, worked, he wrote for the Christian Science Monitor, The Nation, you know, he's, I, I guess he's pretty good shape. Now, we know that the, um, that the war 
in Afghanistan was launched to catch a horrible, horrible man named Osama bin Laden, who had been put in place by the US government in Afghanistan to fight the Ruskies. Because you remember the Ruskies had invaded Afghanistan and held it under their thumb. And the people who fought to drive the Ruskies out were the Taliban. And Osama bin Laden, a very devout Muslim, volunteered to go and fight for his Muslim brothers and sisters. And of course, he became very useful for the, U uh, the US forces trying to push the Ruskies out. And the Ruskies were pushed out, as the British had been pushed out before, as the Indians had been pushed out before, as uh, Genghis Khan had been pushed out before, as Alexander the Great had been pushed out before. You know, if you, if you don't learn by history, <laughs> you're doomed to repeat it. And I just watched Ken Burns again, you know, I come from that generation. And my golly, it seems to me that we ought to learn something about that. Even Korea, for, to some extent. So, there was a problem in Afghanistan if we decide that the man that we got to get is a seven foot tall, kidney failing person. Now, in order to have his dialysis, he has to have electricity. And if he were really hiding in the caves of eastern Afghanistan, you can't plug it in. I'm, I'm serious. He, he wasn't in Afghanistan when we went into Afghanistan. But maybe Bush had to, you know, uh, uh, make sure that his daddy's uh, record of invading uh, uh, Iraq wasn't in vain, so he kind of forgot about Afghanistan. We re invaded Iraq, and that's another story. That's in Southwest Asia, and that is an Arab country. It is quite largely Muslim, large Catholic minority, a number of, uh, there's four, four synagogues in Baghdad at the time we did the invasion and all four of them got bombed out of existence by our heavy bombing that had to go on to save the people of Afghanistan. You see what the Kurds are doing this week? They're trying to have a Kurdistan because they feel very strongly that when the British and the French cut up Southwest Asia that maybe they should have had a piece of the pie too. So we withdraw, remember, we were, we were pulling out. Uh, you, get, you get away from baby Bush and you move to Obama, that guy was born in Kenya, um, and, and you realize that we were backing out of troops. We really were because, quite frankly, some of the people in the State Department at that time were aware that there's no way to win this particular situation. The only way to win is to declare victory and leave, like we did in Vietnam or in Korea. Remember, that war has never come to an end. And uh, our Secretary of State is up there on the DMZ looking at those nasty people across the, the um, DMZ. And if you've been there and, and you realize um, how strongly many Korean people want to unify it, just like Eastern German and Germany, uh, the, the, the game we're playing it doesn't fit there, but let's let's stay in our lecture for tonight, or at least close to it. So about 2002, the insurgency in Afghanistan had purpled down pretty good. The Taliban and whatever uh, Al Qaeda is, we kind of cranked up that word. Uh, I always try to forget, remember where it started, and I still haven't been able to figure out exactly where do we start saying Al Qaeda and stop saying Taliban, and and now we're saying. ISIS in the same situation. And remember, part of what happened in the transition at this period of time from baby Bush into Obama, I won't make any arguments about it, Obama administration, I think what we were doing was we were, we were beginning to morph terrorism into the thing we were fighting. We were no longer fighting to, to find uh, Osama bin Laden, we were now fighting terrorism. Terrorism is everywhere. In fact, in New York today, uh, a guy killed a bunch of people, drove down a bicycle path. I got one of my good friends from Peace Corps days, um, 
rides that bicycle path every night. You think, gosh, he wasn't there at the right time. And it's a terror attack. Well, you know, if every wackle that starts killing people is a terrorist, let's go to look. You may recall the guy in Las Vegas. He must have been shouting, Alu Akbar, Alu Akbar, as he killed all those people. It, it ain't necessarily so. You know, we identify wrong. Now, most of you are close to my age. But are you about 75? <laughs> <laughs> but we do, we do, some of us do remember a time in which we hated the commies. And before that, we hated the nymphs. And before that, we hated the krauts. I mean, so now we had to have a new person to hate because how are you going to keep the military industrial complex running unless you got somebody to hate? Why so, do we have to find somebody to hate? Yeah, that's why do we have to? I don't think we have to. See, this is part of the argument. What was the question again? Why, why do we have to find somebody to hate? And the answer is we don't. But in fact, if you go back to South Pacific, you got to catch them before you're seven or eight to teach them how to hate. But if you're programmed and build a propaganda machine that likes to keep... This country spends more on military than any other country in the world. In fact, we spend more on military than the next seven countries piled down. So we got to keep somebody to hate in order to keep that military industrial <coughs> complex running very well. And I don't know if you all remember, but there was a guy that was closely associated with a baby Bush, a guy by the name of Cheney. And Cheney's company was building a pipeline to get the Tajik and Uzbeki oil down to the Indian Ocean. And it's, but it's now being still built. And uh, Alec Burton has done a good job in making a lot of money there. And I don't want to go into that too much because I want to pick up on this guy. Um, Ashraf, I'm going to call him. He's, he's got a long push to name. And quite frankly, I don't know, has anybody taught school in the last 20 years in Minnesota? <laughs> you know, when those kids come in from, from uh, various countries, especially in Southeast Asia, I have a hard time pronouncing their <coughs> names. And so I'm going to call the guy Ashraf. Because if I call him by his push to name, we're going to have immediate negative feelings because we've been conditioned to see Islam as something to be very leery of. It's really kind of rough on my family because the woman who takes care of my wife who's bedridden with MS happens to be some, from Somalia. And she walked across the street and asked if she could help because she saw that my wife was well, like in a power wheelchair out on the porch. And Fatima came over and said, could I help? And her mother came over to check out the house to make sure it was halal because, you know, we might be frying court and she wanted to make sure we weren't. And she was a charming woman, had eight words of English. I loved her to pieces. I saw her at the precinct caucus and we were for the same um, people. So that worked out really well. So let's pick up on Ashraf. Now this is 2001. He's in charge of the three south, um, what eastern provinces of Afghanistan. He's Pushtu, and he's up against the border. Lots of Pushtu live in Pakistan, and lots of Pushtu live in Afghanistan, and that's because when the British government drew its lines, it didn't pay any attention to what ethnic groups it was cutting apart. It just sliced the line at some place in Whitehall to make it operate that way, and then you make it true. Um, how many people saw Charlie Wilson's War? It's about 2007. Remember that one? This uh, Minnesota congressman goes out and he's going to figure out how to how to fix things up out here. And you saw what happened to him. He got roped into supporting a warlord who had very little to do with caring about Afghanistan as a nation. Was more interested in making sure his pockets were well lined. Um, it's based on a true story, that, that movie, and it was a CIA Mujahideen that was the person that he was fighting for. Mujahideen, uh, a fighter for the good, uh, you know, to translate it a little bit. He is very highly regarded by the State Department because he had fought very bravely against the Soviets. 
In fact, he had earned a reputation among the Afghani people, even people that weren't pushed to, that he was one heck of a guy. One time he was badly wounded, and instead of stopping, he continued the march as he was bleeding and didn't seek a help until after the battle was over. He's, he's a tough dude, and we really liked him. He was also a very close ally of Osama bin Laden, because remember, Osama bin Laden was fighting against the Russians, so then he was a good guy at that time, and he doesn't come, become a bad guy until we switch gears and decide we're going to do another operation. We want to take over that particular country. So in the 1980s, Ashraf is getting a lot of money from the U.S. government. Well, not the U.S. government you can track, but that whole underground U.S. government that the CIA is part of. Um, so he was a good guy. He was a hero. He, he was well seen by Pakistani people. Uh, well, yes, Pakistani people as well, but Afghani people, he was well seen by the U.S. Uh, military, sub-military. Officials in Islamabad really liked him. He, he, had made, uh, he had made connections in the United Arab Republics to, to get funds from people who, who wanted to save Islam from the nasty, godless people from the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, which, by the way, Afghanistan probably brought down the U.S. Socialist Republic. So, the problem was that when the wind down happened, he was really interested in getting his three provinces under his control, which isn't unheard of. Uh, if you watch how warlords operate, they, they try to aggrandize uh, an area that they can rule over but this guy was an interesting guy. He was building schools, and he was um, constructing mosques, and he was really highly regarded by the people of that area. So Ashraf is an interesting guy. So when the U.S. military force began to decide who was the good guys and the bad guys, <coughs> Ashraf unfortunately ended up on the side of the bad guys. He became labeled a terrorist. And once you're labeled a terrorist, a terrorist, then anything goes because you've got to be eliminated from the face of the earth. And I'm going to quote a former U.S. intelligence officer. Here's what he said at this particular time, and I quote, at that time, no one was thinking of where we might be in five years. For the policy folks, it was just screw these little brown guys. You know, the ragheads, those people who ain't us, the other. And as long as you can split the world into good guys and bad guys. You know, the old movies I watched when I fought the Battle of Popcorn Bay in Adrian, Minnesota, many, many years ago, you knew the good guys. They wore white hats, and the bad guys wore black hats, so you knew. The problem is now, the world is far more complex than it, and it was very complex then, but we didn't even know it. So, we've been began bombing villages in Ashraf's territory. I mean, legitimacy is not really the question. He controlled it, not because he had a, an authorization from Kabul or an authorization from Islamabad. He, he had got these three provinces under his control the good old fashioned way by delivering the goods for the people, by making sure people were a little bit better off than they were under the previous warlords and, and limited areas. So, Ashraf was in a situation in which the bombing hit a house close to where he was in one of these particular villages that caught the bombs. So that bombing you're talking about, is this after 9-11? Yes. Can you repeat that? Was yeah, that was this after 9-11? And the answer is no, this was earlier. Oh, before? Before 2011, yeah. I didn't know we were bombing there. Well, I know we didn't know we were bombing there. That's part of the point, is that we were, we were gearing up to do that for the next go around. We didn't know what to do as we demobilized. What are you going to do with these people who are fighting the Soviet Union? And now they're armed, and they're trying to 
jockey for their own positions, and when they begin jockey for their own positions, they become terrorists by definition because they're not playing in that fortress called the U.S. Embassy um, that runs out of Kabul and can't really step out of Kabul uh, at all. So the bombs kill a bunch of his relatives, and he's wounded and climbs out of the rubble. And the next morning, he sent word to his supporters, surrender. Because we can't fight back against this particular machine. You know, he's telling all the people in his provinces, surrender. Give it up. We can't do it. So he comes in and talks to some of the CIA operatives. And he said, look, we understand that you're in charge now. Cut me some breaks, and I'm willing to go along with you. Well, unfortunately, before he's able to do that, another dude shows up that wants the three southern provinces. His name is Pasha Khan. Khan. Interesting name, Aga Khan. Pasha, what does Pasha mean in this part of the world? You know, he's really pulling in the big words. He's trying to make himself really something. So he became the good guy because the CIA operatives found him easier to work with. He, he spoke some English. That helps a lot because then they're us as opposed to them. If he, if he didn't speak some English, of course, none of the CIA operatives, very few of them, could have spoken to him. So here we are, December 20th. 9-11. We have propped up a puppet by the name of Hamid Karzai to be the president of Afghanistan. We're going to have an election, and you know if an election is held, everything's all right because democracy is good. And if you believe that, I have a bridge in Brooklyn that I'd be willing to sell you the electric, the aluminum siding for. Um, because you vote, and I quote, it ain't necessarily so the things you're liable. So, in 2001, Kar Karzai is picked to be the dude in charge because we're going to put somebody in there we want after the situation. So what did Af Afraf do? He's hiding in, in Pakistan by now because he's been driven out of his own territories. He sends in some of his family members, close allies, political allies, in a um, convoy to go to Kabul and tell the Kabul government, look, we're willing, again, to join with you and try to create something bigger than what we got. I mean, he's, he's learning. Unfortunately, the Pasha Khan tells the CIA that he's coming to take over Kabul, that this whole convoy is coming in an attack to take Kabul. Well, you know, it's a bunch of elders, it's a bunch of his relatives that are in, in this convoy. And of course, Pasha Khan comes out there and tells him, you go a step forward, I'm going to get rid of you. And he calls in the US strike force. And they bomb the heck out of the convoy and kill a bunch more of his relatives. So they don't give up. They turn around, they go a different way, and make it to Kabul. Now, how can that happen? I don't know, but I got a, pic a picture in my mind of that even when we know everything, we don't know very much. And we, he was able to, to find a way around all of our knowledge and all of our satellites and, the, and they were able to make it into. And so what happens is he gets there and he sends his son in to see uh, the president and the president says, well, gee, you're a pretty good guy. You're really gonna, sign up with us and uh, he said his, the son says yes we're really going to sign up with you we're willing to go along and help construct a new country and we we're very interested in doing that well Pasha Khan is pretty upset by this because he's gotten some control with a lot of CIA support of those provinces and so the special forces have to get rid of this guy because this guy is a threat to their new control policy under Pasha Khan. 
far between the threat of a U.S. assassination, and now he's also, when he crosses over into Pushtu territory in Pakistan, he's now under pressure from the Pakistani government to give up and go back and face a shipment to Guantanamo. And he doesn't really think that's a good idea. You know, the guys get to be 70 years old or so, and you know, he's been fighting all his life, and Guantanamo just doesn't sound like a good idea to him, um, even though the CIA apparently told him that if he'd go to Guantanamo for a few years, they could resurrect him as a hero again and send him back into the situation if Pasha Khan didn't turn out all right. You gotta keep, you know, a little of, of your balance going. So, Karzai, the president, Arsraf is out of the country, hiding in Pakistan, probably pretty close to one of his buddies, Osama bin Laden. Um, and and uh, he says, you know, I am a leader of my people. I'm a hero of my people, and I just don't like the idea of spending time in a U.S. prison. I can't understand why not. He'd probably get turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> so, now we have trouble because Pasha Khan begins to be so a bad ruler that the people are against him. And of course, when the people go against him, even the CIA bails out. And they really do. They go to Ashraf and they say, all right, come on back in from the cold. We'll let you have those provinces as sort of your, what's the word, satraf? It's an old Babylonian word that means the chunk of territory. And he's going to be given it. So they arrest his brother in order to pry him into the situation. Well, that's a good idea because there's a close relationship between brothers in Pushtu society, so that would do it. Well, you know, there's a strange feeling going on here among Pushtu supporters of Ashraf, who are still, you know, they fought with him as comrades in the war. They, they got a funny feeling that this, this feels an awful lot like the Soviet Union again. That this pressure that's being put on us by these, these uh, what were they called, protective villages, you know, this whole idea, the idea kind of started in Malaysia when the British government were fighting the communists and they would make protected villages. You, you saw some of that in, in Burns's film of what a protected village was. You know, it was a prison camp that you put people in to make sure that they weren't, as Mao said, to be a good gorilla, you have to swim like a fish in the water of the peasants. You have to be integrated into the community. And the best way to keep people from being in, in, integrated in the community was isolate them. Now, if you name a certain group terrorists, it's really hard. So Pasha Khan begins to not look so good. Ashraf is being tempted to come back. They're waging a tremendous drone warfare by this time on everybody. And I know the drones are perfect. We all know that smart bombs, when they were bombing Iraq, only hit military targets. And again, I have a bridge. Dozens of the commanders in the field who were not necessarily terrorists, who were former people fighting against the Soviet Union that had some strong feelings about their own territory, probably not really in connection with Kabul, so those guys were getting bombed because they were gradually becoming the terrorists. Now, if, if this story isn't adequate, and Gopal does a much better job than I do, so what he's trying to do, he's trying to look, let's look at the reality in Afghanistan rather than the reality from the U.S. or from the U.S. Embassy, because there are no civilians from the U.S. Embassy that go any place except to a party at another embassy. And when they do, they're lined up in a convoy with incredible support so they won't get shot driving down the streets of Kabul. The same thing was true in the green zone in Iraq. It was, it was a fortress and it, it was crazy. Oh, this isn't enough, I don't think. And if, 
if we're going to rely upon one source, I think we'd get in trouble and we rely on just one angle because Bo Paul's got a, he's got an axe to grind, there's no question about it. So let's go, and here, this was a piece I picked up in a uh, military journal. And the guy's name in this particular case, and probably just as hard, he's a U.S. Marine named Frank Biggio, B-I-G-G-I-O. And he arrives in Nawa, which is one of the districts in the southeast provinces that we're talking about. And he arrives in the summer of 2009. 2009. Back then, he recalls, it was a lawless, ungoverned place like an apocalyptic scene out of the movie, Apocalypse Now, which you remember was based on the horrible Conrad story of Heart of Darkness in Central Africa. The battle to secure the district was tough. Four Marines were killed during the deployment and Big Yo says, we had worked hard, I'd lost my team, team chief, a good buddy. So if you're one of the people in one of those outposts, you're really pretty strongly feeling that you wonder kind of what are we doing, what's happening, I saw my buddies get killed, I don't quite understand the whole picture. So seven months later, after they occupy Nawa, the town, um, it's peaceful. There are, it's, it's a wonderful counterinsurgency example. It shows how peacekeeping by the U.S. Marines really works. Why a, a Marine could walk down the streets of Nawa with no fears. He could go to one of the hooch places. Remember, Islam is totally opposed to alcohol. <clears throat> so you have to set up hooch bases to show you really love the local folk. Probably have a pork sandwich while you're at it. So, in October 2016, the Taliban overran Nawa. They took over that outpost. And they did it in pretty evil forces. It was never safe, by the way, for Afghanis to walk down the street in Nawa anyway. Because remember <clears throat> that if you look suspicious, this is a free fire zone. So there had been people shot by the Marines um, by accident, collateral damage, uh, you know, not, not intended. <clears throat> so Nawa was overrun. Bigio has been cycled out, but he says where he's living, I would like to see places like Nawa thriving economically and politically today. And I wonder if our sacrifices there were worth anything. Now, this is a military guy, a Marine. You know, once a Marine, always a Marine. He's not going to have a total change of mind, but he is questioning the situation. Now, the Taliban in 2011 and in 2016 and probably into 2018, and who knows, the Taliban really profits from the money that comes down the ladder from the U.S. government through the CIA. Because if there are cases that can d document you know, here's a suitcase of money and I'm going to buy you so you'll be friends to us for this week. And that guy's a terrorist because you told me he was. Because you're actually fighting a tribal war against him. So the Marines come in and bomb the heck out of him. You gain, where does the money go? Mostly into your pockets. And this is a pretty accurate picture of what we're talking about here. So when the Marines took over, they, it was a bad place. When the Marines were there with total force, they were able to enact a certain sort of peace in the main streets as long as you were a Marine. Well, gussied out as a Marine, you could make it down the streets. Um, <laughs> Patrios, pa pa Patrios, you know, the, the um, general. Uh, he, he had a, yeah, yeah Patrias. He uh, had a uh, PowerPoint presentation about Nawa made up that he went around to the State Department here in the United States showing how the pacification movement was working very well. Well, I kind of got grew up when the Taliban took it over, so they had to deep six that particular, but they came up with another village in the north. 
that was run by opium warlords. <laughs> that was quite peacefully because enough money was there that people were in pretty good shape. Um, the Marines were safe, but they weren't very long. So, 2015, flashing ahead, there's a, um, uh, let's call him a governor of Nawa, who has been able to a certain extent um, stabilize the situation, kind of weighing off against the really radical members of the <coughs> Taliban and saying, let's take it easy, let's not bring the airplanes down on us again, let's play along as much as we can. The Taliban is still there, but it's been suppressed partly because it's tied into the leadership that is the local community. The local community is a little tired of the bombing, so they pull off the action. Now, let's see what happens here. This is what I'm going to talk about, an army of ghost soldiers. They still are the main operatives. They, the United States government has, why, if these 5,000 that were sent in, if we add them up, it's probably about 16,000 official troops. Has anybody read the news lately, a couple of months ago, where some American soldier was on the border of Niger and Mali, and he got shot? What the heck is the Special Forces guy doing on the border of Niger and Mali? What have we got? Probably as many as 12,000 troops scattered throughout Africa, training Africans to fight the bad guys. And we're going to identify the bad guys, don't worry. We did, if you watched Black Ship Down, you know how we do. The bad guys are painted, we go get them, and then that makes them bad guys, if you go get them enough. Um, the government of Kabul, now it seems now uh, is being somewhat controlled by the governor, who is somewhat loyal to Kabul. And they send out money, supplied by your taxpayer's dollar, to the governor, and you say, here, hire 700 troops, cops, peacemakers, as we call them. Um, and if you do that, we'll keep the money flowing, and you'll be able to stay in charge, and you won't get bombed as much. It'll be a pretty good deal for everybody. So the governor, and he turns out to be a pretty good guy, the governor says, yep, let's do that. Uh, so he goes out, and he hires some people he's going to call the colonels and lieutenants of this particular force. Would it be surprising to you that those guys are often going to be his cousins? Yeah. I think it should not be a surprise. Now the interesting thing here is that you're one of the cousins that's been put, you're supposed to guard this particular piece on the road. And I um, say to your cousin here, is enough troops to hire, have enough money to hire 50 troops. Kid them out, get them ready to be good fighters. Now, if I only hire about 12 guys and keep the supply money, it's a real profit. These are the gold soldiers that are fighting much of the battle in Afghanistan right now. They do not exist. But we can give them names, and we can send a dossier up to Kabul, and then that ultimately ends up in the CIA office in Langley. Ghost soldiers. Ghost, they, they're not the ghost soldiers that the Lakota brought up. They're, they're honest to God, not there. Halloween night is a good time to go looking for most of the Afghan um, forces that we got in the field. <coughs> the names of dead people, <laughs> you know, it's almost like Daly's Chicago, you know, you voted the graveyard. Um, you remember Daly vote early, vote often, um, but he was supported John's, uh, anyway. So the governor of this particular area resigns. He, he's an honest man, and he realizes the thing has got totally out of control, and he described his own knowledge of what he had put in action. In one district he said there were 10 ch checkpoints and each of these 10 checkpoints had 25 men assigned to it. On one visit 
and all the checkpoints, he found 96 people. 54 had AK-47s, remember that's the Russian ordinance that was left over from when the Soviet Union invaded the country. Most of them were unarmed because the money spent for guns had gone someplace else. And most of them were actually unfit to work. Most of them were guys with missing limbs and missing parts of their bodies because they'd been involved in fights for a long period of time. So the new president, whose name was Ashraf Ghani, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, he's the next puppet that's picked, and Ashraf Ghani meets the governor of this region, and the governor says, I can't take it anymore. I've been trying, I've been trying what you're trying, but I can't make it anymore. I don't make this governor into a bad guy or good guy. I don't say, I don't say that Ghani was, is a bad guy, good guy. I'm just saying it is what it is. Around half of the 26,000 personnel assigned to the provinces right now do not exist. Their salaries end up in personal accounts that usually are banked in Dubai or one of the Arab Emirates because that's a pretty stable place to have your money because those petrodollars are still worth something. The military last year put a U.S. military put a hundred million dollars into supporting this area. A hundred million dollars. And most of those dollars have nothing to do with fighting the terrorists because the terrorists to some extent are ghost people because they come and go because sometimes they're on our side and sometimes they're on the other side and sometimes they're on their own side and any idea that there's a concerted action to take over uh, Afghanistan doesn't really understand this. So, now, now uh, the town we were talking about er, er, earlier fell to the Taliban. And so the U.S. decided that they would make an example of this because Atreus? Atreus. Atreus had betrayed us. And, oops, excuse me. Nasty. How long will Nawa stay out of control? Because we retook it. We dumped in drones, we dumped in air power, we did everything we possibly could. It was one of the largest military operations in the last couple of years in Afghanistan. We retook Nawa, this small, dusty town. How long is it going to stay in control of the U.S. or the U.S. Afghani supporters? Because remember, most of the Afghani supporters are ghost supporters. And the Taliban probably has people in the field. Big EO, let's go back, remember the Marine that we started talking about? Big EO has retired from the, the services and he's living in one of the Arab Emirates as a business leader who's making pretty good money as a go-between between U.S. corporations and the uh, Abu, du Abu Dubai um, government, I think that's where he is. Um, the reason he got that job is because actually his Arabic had become pretty good with working with troops who spoke Arabic. More educated people often, often go beyond their tribal language and use Arabic as a lingua franca. So he, he learned Arabic pretty well in the field and so he's got the job of cut what he learned in the Marines. So maybe the recruiting guys are right. Work for the Marines and get a good job when you get out. He's got a good job. He's uh, working for a foreign corporation in a foreign land and he's not planning to come home because he's kind of unhappy about the way we run things here. I quote him. It might be true, if I really think about it, now it was lost before it was won we didn't have any incentives to offer the soldiers on the ground. If you want to have Afghani troops fight for you, you've got to make their life better. And if you trickle the money through a government that has no control of the areas that has to call upon warlords to do the fighting, and the money is distributed that way, you're not pulling together a nation, and you're not touching most of the troops. It's all going in the pockets of a few people and the troops don't get very much money. I'm, I, 
I'm quoting him uh, in his residence in Dubai. There must be an end point to this, but I don't know where. We can't stay there forever, but I don't know when. So we're in worse shape today than we were <clears throat> under Obama. We're in worse shape today than we were under baby Bush. We're in worse shape today than the British were and we're worse shape today than the... We fought how long there? 16 years? The Russians pulled out because they were beat, or the Soviet Union, but it was a lot of Russians that were... Yeah, when the body bags came back to the Soviet Union, the Soviet people began to agitate and ultimately leads to the downfall of the Soviet Union, I think. I think um, and I will never have that kind of problem because we're so infinitely wealthy, they can keep us drugged with color TVs and cabins up to the lake, and we will never get upset as long as those things are ours. And so the, the new tax regulations, of course, will all trickle down to us and we'll live happily ever after. And if you believe all that, I have a bridge in Brooklyn. Now Trump, he might make things worse. He might make things better because I don't know what his quote foreign policy is. I have no idea because it seems like our Secretary of State has to go around and say no what the President said isn't what I said. He really said this and you know if we're going to call people who are the presidents of their country by names like Rocket Boy we're going we're gonna to get a lot of friends in that country. Uh, the best way to make the North Korean people rally to the cause of North Korea and its nationalism is to call their president bad names. It's the best way to do it. And we're really good at it. The best way to create terrorists is by creating terrorists. Because you need the terrorists in order to keep the machine running. And so, okay, you get it. I, I tried to take you in to some of the roots of the way it operates, pretty much real. And to see it through the eyes of Ashraf, he, he, he could have been, and, and, and if you weren't dead, he probably still could be a very good ally of the US if given the proper situation. But if you bomb his people and kill his cousins, you're not gonna make him your friend. Ultimately, he's gonna be going with whatever thing he thinks is gonna be good for this week. And that's it. Now, you're supposed to talk about Pakistan, too. I have a question. We know what we shouldn't do. What should we do? Yeah. Well, you know, you got to watch out for me because I've been living for too long and thought about these things for too long. 1963, I was walking down the uh, hall in St. Mary's College, now university, and they just named universities, you know. You, oh, we're a university. Hamlin is now a university, you know. Once it was a college. Um, once I, I taught at St. Cloud for a long time, and once it was a teacher's college, and suddenly it became a university. But we didn't get any more pay, by the way. And so the, um, the sad thing about it is I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And returned Peace Corps volunteers from Afghanistan at the University of Nebraska, 40 years ago, started an Afghan studies department. Now, if you wanted to find people to look at Afghanistan and do some of the think tank operations, don't pick a guy whose expertise is Southwest Asia. Pick somebody whose expertise is Afghanistan, who speaks Pushtu or Uzbek or Tari or whatever it is. So I'm, I still suffer from that illusion that you got to know. Remember this guy and remember what, what was his name? Music man. You got to know the territory. You got to know the territory. If you really want to operate in any field, if you really want to do better or even win, quote unquote, you got to know the territory. And if you had people who spent two years in small villages in Afghanistan and speak the local language, and they now were doing a think tank at a major university, it would seem to me that's where you'd go to get your expertise. 
You wouldn't go to a guy who's been trained in schools and then works for a Rand Corporation. I really think that's true. Now, I went to Peace Corps to Guinea, West Africa, and I went because the Soviets were building a major air base in Guinea, which would be able to, if you look at a map, Guinea sticks out of the west coast of Africa. It's the shortest place between Af Africa and the U.S. Um, it supplied Cuba for a period of time. And Sergeant Shriver went to meet the president of that country, his name was Sekou Toure. Sergeant Shriver was, you know, the brother-in-law of the president. And Kennedy sent him out there. He spoke really good French so he could speak to the people. And he said, gee, Sekou, um, don't you think uh, it's a little dangerous to put all your eggs in one basket? And Sekou said, well, you know, when I declared independence of my country against the French occupation of my country, the first thing I do was flew to Washington and asked Eisenhower if I could have some support from the U.S. And Eisenhower said, no, because my buddy is the president de Gaulle of France. And so we can't give you any help. And so Secretary flew to Moscow and he got the help. Now the help had lots of strings attached and he finds out later on it wasn't a good idea. But you see, there was an opportunity and we missed the opportunity because we didn't know I mean, I don't know if, if you can believe this, but I, I went to the Peace Corps, and my father thought I was a New Guinea the whole time I was gone. I was in Guinea on the west coast of Africa. <laughs> Who knew? I, you know, you still hear it on the news. It's uh, India, France, and Africa. Africa is made up of 52 countries with 800 languages. And so I guess you got to know the territory is something we're not really very good at. Well, even we know the history and we still repeat it. Why do we still repeat it? Well, the trouble is with history, as, as um, Henry Ford once said, is it mumbles a lot. History is, is written by the winners. And history is written by the people in power. That's why it's been hard to have women's history. It's been hard to have black history. It's certainly hard to have gay and lesbian history because that voice is not heard. It doesn't percolate through. We don't hear Afghanis telling us about Afghanistan. We hear experts who probably have never been to Afghanistan and don't speak any of the languages except the four written ones, perhaps. But they don't know the languages that aren't written that are the major majority of the country. So what am I saying? You know, one of the reasons why Ashraf had a lot of support was he built schools. We haven't been building anything in Afghanistan for a long time. We did. There was a period when, when the Taliban was at its lowest ebb. We were doing some of that. We were building some, some bridges and doing some actual construction work that meant something. You know, Jimmy, you know, who we knew was the worst president we ever had. Uh, I, I, talk, I talked to him two years ago, 90 year old man, and he's out there with a the hammer with Habitat for Humanity building houses for people. And you know what? People in the communities, he built houses and really like them. I don't know why. I can't understand that a bit. We spend so incredible amount of money killing people that if we spent just a little bit more with hospitals, I think we gain much more power, because this is a fluid country. It's a very fluid situation. And I don't think it does much good just to pick a boss in Kabul who can't even leave the capital because he'd be killed if he did, or at least attacked. I think we're probably better doing that low down thing. It takes a long time. I was in my village for two years in Guinea. I'm using an example, I'm sorry. But my father said, my, my father is a very intelligent man. He, uh, he was a member of the Farm Labor Party instead of what Humphrey made it into. Um, the, uh, he said, you know, if I were in that town you're in, two weeks I'd know everything there was to know about it. It was a town with 500 people in it. And then, my father's not stupid, he said, and then if I were there, for two months I realized I didn't know anything. And perhaps after 20 years I would know something. We have to learn to pick 
the people who know a longer term and who know the people in intimately, who know people and speak their language and have lived in their shoes. Remember the old saying, Dennis Banks, by the way, died. Yeah. Yeah. And Dennis Banks told me one time that it really was an Ojibwe saying. You got to walk seven days in my moccasins before you should say anything at all about me. And I, and I really I really think that it's still grassroots construction and schools and Peace Corps. Now I'm also a life member of Fulbright and I've taught in universities in three countries in the world. How did I get to have three Fulbrights? Well, I'll tell you how. You pick the country that nobody else will go to. <laughs> so I was Fulbright, taught at the University in Central African Republic. I was Fulbright in Haiti and taught it, helped found the, the new university, Kiskalia, which is named after a Tainu person who had fought against the Spanish when they first occupied the island. And I went back to Guinea in 2002 after leaving there in 1965, and some of my students' fathers knew me, and I was at a meeting in the history department in the capital city and a guy was sitting across me and he, he finally said it. He said, you know, you're not the guy that taught the prostitutes at the bar and gave you how to do the twist, are you? So they remembered me, <laughs> even all those years later. So that's, I mean, my answer is it, it sounds so Pollyanna, so far out. But you know, after we've repeated the stupidity of thinking war can do it, maybe we ought to try some other thing that was really off the wall. You know. If you do the same thing again and again, and it doesn't work, you're getting a little silly if you do that. You remember that old story about the guy who's looking for his keys, he lost his keys, and he's uh, looking all around under the street light. The other guy comes up and says, what's happening? He says, I'm looking for my keys. And he said, well, where did you lose them? Oh, about two blocks down there. Why aren't you down there looking for it? No, I'm under the light. <laughs> I think that fits what we're talking about. If we can't see the light because we choose not to, then we've got the problem. Do you have time now for questions? Oh, yes, please. I, I would ramble on forever. I got, this is page 13 of 26. I'm going to Pakistan next. And you don't want to do that because it gets more complicated. You've got the briefing book. And by the way, the, the briefing book does, you know, the superficial scope that we get in our history books and our in our textbooks, questions. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, sorry. go ahead. Did, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, there was I don't remember the year exactly, but uh, when the Russians came in, it was then that the guy that was running Afghanistan had disposed of the king. Yes. Now were they successful? Yes. Except for one province, I think that was under yep. under control of the Soviets. Uh, no, uh, of the king. One, one was uh, controlled by a guy named uh, Ahmed something. Yep. And he was later assassinated. Yep. Um, did Afghanistan then any time saw any light? You know, I, I would say no. Um, Afghani nationalism is really not nationalism. It's really tribalism. Analogous to it is when Sun Yat-sen came back to China in 1911. He's been educated in Japan and the United States. He comes back to China, doesn't speak very much Chinese anymore. He comes back and he tries to set up a democratic government and the warlords, including Chiang Kai-shek, take him on and he's ultimately kicked over. And we had a situation in which nobody was in charge of China until the Japanese invaded us and then we fought back against the invader but the guy who did most of the fighting was Mao Zedong. Surprisingly enough, the people really rallied around him at the end of the war, and that's the way it has to happen. I mean, you have to have a sense of building the, the nation, and it isn't built by U.S. votes. Oh, uh, he probably got some raw information about Mao. He didn't fight most of the war against Japan. He, hided, he was hiding in the northwest of the Yanan area, mm -hmm. and he no, he, uh, he didn't fight a lot of the Japanese battles. Okay. He, his policy was to stay poor and so what's have your, some her, uh, what's your What's your study source? How do you know these things? Because I, I used to, I, 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 um, from 
the time I went to school in China until I left the China in 1990, you know, all the history were probably what you 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 learned. Yeah. And that's just you know, it's, actually, it's, it's not true. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, propaganda. I, I like the word truth <laughs> and I like the word false news because, quite frankly, if you're going to write the story of Richard Nixon and you rely on the source called uh, Pat, Patty Nixon's story of her daddy's last years in the White House, you're going to have a different story. And she was an eyewitness. She was right there. You're going to have a different story if you read it from somebody who really was opposed to him. So kind of, you got to think about the fact that all truths are relative. Well, that, that, is, that is correct, but I have personal experience um, to show that Mao was not a great person for the ordinary Chinese. Right. How, how, okay. how, old, and, how old were you when Mao died? Uh, I was born in 1963, so he died in 1976. So you knew him pretty personally. Oh yeah, my uh, my family um, was actually uh, one of the millions of victims under his policy. Yeah. Well then, and then I know your truth is 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 very good. It's very strong, and it is true as you see it. Well, no, I, this is the way history is, and we're not going to argue about it. Oh, yeah, you're no. right. I mean, you're right that my my vision is is kind of a. A superficial one. I'm not an expert in Chinese history or studies, so I'm going to take your word for being better than mine in this case. So you're right. We have a tendency to know what we know. Go ahead. No. Oh, oh you're, you're next. Not, uh, I was born in '64. Oh. <laughs> I come from the same country, right. but I agree with you. Everybody's relative. The truth is, I don't think we can ever can get the pure truth. No, no I think so the truth. We, we just. But I, I know when we're going to get the truth. The truth is going to be that day when we go, oh, oh, oh. Mm. that's when we got the truth. I mean, that's the only real truth. So be careful of that word. History is constantly being revised. And history is constantly being seen by different points of view. And you've got to think it through. I mean, that's what we're, this kind of discussion is about. Is, reading the documents and then I'm criticizing these documents. Well, I'm criticizing them as I pointed out from a particular point of view. Doesn't make them right. And so I honor your truth. I have a question about a good author that you said, no good man among the living. How about for Pakistan? Because that is more referring Yeah, well, to you know, the Pakistan, I would give the young woman who won the Nobel Prize oh. the oh, first yeah. read because her book takes you to a village that is faced by Taliban oppression. And it tells a quite a bit different story about what happened in Pakistan under control of people who came from the outside. They weren't us. They weren't even the Pakistan government. Her suffering really began with Taliban occupation of her village. And what was this? I am Malaya. What's her name? I am Malaya. I am Malaya. Yeah. She won the State Department. I mean, she won the Nobel Prize. Of course, look who won the Nobel Prize for Literature this year. I don't know if you read that author, but this wonderful Japanese man, if you looked at the world through his eyes, you'd give up and, you know, not ever come out of your house again. Um, I don't necessarily agree with his vision of the universe, but he won the Nobel Prize. Doesn't make him right. But it is interesting to see his point of view. Okay, now this is taking us off the track, but I re recently read the Panama Papers, and my perception of the world completely changed with that because there is so much dark money. Nobody who has a lot of money pays their taxes. I feel like a fool because I pay my taxes like a good citizen. And, and it sounds as though the economies of the world don't add up to the amount that is being, like you said, pocketed by these Everywhere, whether it's arms dealers, whether it's well, heads of state. I always get a kick out of the term black market because it is the world's market. The only way that the Europeans were able to make a lot of money in the world going back to 1500 was by colonization, but more importantly, capitalization of that colonization. And that meant you had to have a product that had 
a totally elastic demand curve. The more you deliver, the more people want. So you start out with something like the sugar industry, which destroyed much of northeastern Brazil, and you bring people from Africa and destroy their way of life in order to grow it, and then you poison the people of Europe with it. But the nice thing about one spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, more spoons full of sugar, and then make it into rum, or distill it a little further. Or if you don't want that one, what about uh, Raleigh and uh, Durham, North Carolina? Tobacco, really a wonderful thing, because the whole world smokes tobacco. Even some Chinese people smoke tobacco. If they didn't before the European presence. And so European presence took a Native American ritual thing and brought it around the world to become a nasty habit. Coffee was another one you could make a lot of money about. And cocaine is another one. And opium is another one. And there's money in them dark hills. So it isn't just quote, raw materials, it's part of the early stages of capitalism that begin this process of, yep. But if you want to find out what's really happening, you've got to go where the money goes. You know, go back to Ronnie Reagan and how he fought the, you know, how he armed the countries <coughs> by selling arms to Iraq and then, you know. In the areas, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but in the areas where there are coalitions where the U.S. Military, like in this year with the French, are the perceptions by the locals of those other national uh, troops different than the U.S. How are they? Yeah. Let, let's go to let's go to Mali okay. or Niger, either one of the countries. We achieved our independence from France in 1960. So some old guys like me remember when the French were here. I was in Bangui in the Central African Republic, and in 1947, after the Second World War, there was still a law in the books which was honored, and that is, if a black man stops you on the sidewalk, you're allowed to use three blows of the chicote, which is you know, the cat of nine tails with little lead weights on the end of each. You get three blows, which means about 27 blows times 27 blows times 27 blows. That was my legal right as a Frenchman to do to the subject. Remember, I'm a citizen, you're a subject. Now, if my granddad told me that, heck, my grandfather, who's been five generations away from Ireland, doesn't like Brits. You know, people have long memories. And I would suggest that France in Mali or Niger looks like an occupying force of the old guys we tried to kick out. And the distinction between a Frenchman and an American is very hard to make if you're an African villager. Now, the guy who got killed was black. He didn't speak a word of any of the local dialects, didn't speak French. He really wasn't one of us. I, I, I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah, they, we see it differently. The occupying force that looks like the good guys to us and look like the bad guys there, even if they're fighting terrorists, self-identified by us to be the terrorists, and they happen to be my cousins that you're attacking. And who does the policy, so when they're in coalitions, is there actually some agreement on, on policies and procedures? Or does the U.S. just say, this is the way it's going to no, be? No, the, the French are real fussy about retaining some command in the field. And it's kind of like when they try to get Eisenhower to be over. De Gaulle never liked Eisenhower because De Gaulle always felt, I'm still France. C'est moi, l'état, the upper one of deluge. You know, I'm the state after me, the floods. Um, the French are very strong about containing their own control of their own forces. But who came in to do the strafing and the driving off of the French military? And who actually picked up the body of this young man? It was the French military that came out. Because the French have more people that speak French than we do, even in France. Though remember, not everybody in Spain speaks Spanish, as we're finding out. Any other questions? She has one that she wants. Please. We got, we got 10 minutes, my overtime. No, yeah, five minutes. <laughs> five minutes. Who, the library closes. Who, who would you like to see 
running the United States government? Who do you see? Who do you? Wow, that's a good question. Um, you know, power corrupts and total power corrupts totally. So even if it were Bernie Sanders, there would still be that sub-government and it would be very difficult to erase it in one or two terms in office. And, and even Bernie, eight years from now, is going to be fairly old. And, you know, they're, they're, it's like the Aegean stables. You clean them out every night, but the next morning they're full of it again. Um, I, I wouldn't make anybody the absolute hero of the world. I, I think one of our problems is we do look for the hero to come in riding on horseback and take care of things for us. And I guess I would look for a greater grassroots democracy in this country. I would like to see us work harder at picking good school board members so that our kids would learn more than simply the party line that they're getting now in most cases. And I would like to see people work on their city council members to make sure that justice is done at that level. You know, like that. So I don't know if it, you win by getting the best president in the world. I don't know if that'll do it. We gotta have a change of culture, and that has to begin at the grassroots. Amen. That's more, that's more you wanted to hear. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm sorry I got here. Well, you may have correct. Thank you. It was a very good lecture. Thank you. Thank you.